Hey guys and welcome back or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I like to focus on unsolved true crime but also history, looking at those little moments throughout history that you're not taught about in school. Today I have another episode and what's kind of turned into an accidental series on my channel, Unethical Human Experiments. From 1946 to 1948, the US government conducted unconscionable and unethical experiments in Guatemala, in which more than 1,000 vulnerable citizens were deliberately infected with sexually transmitted diseases, specifically syphilis, gonorrhea and chancroid. You'll often see the study referred to as the Guatemala Syphilis Study or Syphilis Experiment, but it's probably just more accurate to refer to it as an STD experiment. To this day, many of the people intentionally infected with syphilis and the other diseases have been left untreated. And what I'm going to share with you today is more upsetting than you'll ever be able to imagine, so please do only proceed if you have a particularly strong stomach and strong mind. As I said, this experiment happened in the 1940s, but it wouldn't really come into public consciousness until around 2010-2011. It flew under the radar for many years because the data from this study was simply never published. And we don't know with certainty why it was never published, but the likelihood is because they just knew how unethically the study had been conducted. It wasn't going to be a good look for them. Some of the data from this would be sort of like subtly pushed into other studies over the years by the researchers involved, but the Guatemala study itself was just brushed under the carpet. Some people do have the impression that the people involved in these unethical studies all these decades ago didn't know how bad they were then, that were just judging history by modern standards. And don't get me wrong, I do think that can be applicable in certain historical stories, but this is not one of them. The researchers at the time knew how bad this was, there's lots of evidence to suggest so, but they did it anyway. I mean, this Guatemala study was literally being carried out at the same time that everything was unfolding at Nuremberg, with German physicians standing trial for taking part in medical experiments on concentration camp prisoners. People all around the world, especially doctors, scientists, researchers, knew about this. They knew about the discussion around ethics and using human subjects. But this study wouldn't be discovered until June 2003 when Wellesley College historian Professor Susan Reverby came across a number of documents donated to the University of Pittsburgh by a Dr John Cutler, who was one of the main people on the ground in Guatemala. He'd donated boxes of documents back in the 1990s to the university before he died in early 2003, but until this point, nobody had really thought to look through them. Now, Professor Reverby was actually looking at the Tuskegee syphilis experiment for a book that she was writing, which Cutler had also been heavily involved in, and seeing as Tuskegee is going to be very relevant to this video, here's a very quick overview of what happened there. So between 1932 and 1972, a study was conducted by the US Public Health Service and the CDC on nearly 400 black men who had syphilis. They wanted to track the disease's progress through the body, following it from the early stages all the way through to late stages, neurosyphilis and beyond. Now importantly in Tuskegee, these men were not infected with syphilis for the sake of the study, they already had it going in. Not to say that's any less ethical of course, they simply never informed the men of their diagnosis and told them that instead they just had bad blood. Despite penicillin being discovered as a fantastic cure for syphilis in the 1940s and penicillin being widely available in the USA, treatment was withheld, meaning that in the end, a number of them died from the disease or related complications, and their wives and children caught it as well. The 40-year study in Tuskegee was a major violation of ethical standards, and in 1997, President Bill Clinton formally apologised on behalf of the United States. Now I do have a whole episode on the Tuskegee study that I'll link down below in case anyone is interested in hearing the full story, but that's a very brief, very quick overview. So Dr Cutler was one of the main people involved in Tuskegee and in Guatemala, but for a long time no one knew about the latter. That was until Professor Reverby shared her findings with the United States government officials and the CDC. It was pretty clear that they were going to need to conduct a pretty thorough investigation into this. 
So whilst Reverby came across these documents first in 2003, she sort of didn't really clock what they fully were. It wasn't until years later, around 2009, 2010, I think she said, that she actually properly looked at them and was like, oh, this is serious. I need to tell people about this. The documents found just donated to the University of Pittsburgh included hundreds of written exchanges between people involved, experimental notebooks including handwritten lists of subjects. There were 9,000 subject note cards, so individual records of each subject used in the study and what was done to them. There were 594 photographs and of course the final reports with information that would never be published. In October 2010, President Obama formally apologised to Guatemalan President Alvaro Colom, and he asked the Institute of Medicine to conduct a review of these experiments. At the same time, he also asked the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues to convene a panel of experts to review the current state of medical research around the world, to ensure that incidents such as this don't happen again, weren't happening again. The Commission's report, Ethically Impossible STD Research in Guatemala from 1946 to 1948, was published in September 2011 and concluded that the Guatemala experiments involved unconscionable basic violations of ethics, even as judged against the researchers' own recognition of the requirements of medical ethics of the day. Pretty much everything we know about the study today has come from this commission's report, and even they don't have all the answers. We don't know why certain decisions were made. We don't even know why Dr. Cutler even donated all his documents to the university, when he could have just disposed of them and nobody would ever have known a thing. But it seems like whilst Cutler did know this was unethical, he wasn't ashamed of what he'd done. In the 1990s, after reparations had been made for Tuskegee, Dr. Cutler was interviewed for a special, and he said the worst thing about the Tuskegee experiment was that it ended when it did. He said it was one of the best things he'd ever been involved in. And then very shortly after this, he donated the documents about the Guatemala experiment. So we can kind of assume he just didn't care. But I mean, he couldn't even argue that the study in Guatemala led to scientific breakthroughs because the results were never published. So what was the point? I suppose we should start at the beginning. Like, why did they want to conduct experiments into STDs to begin with? Why was this such a huge thing? Well, during World War II, which ended in 1945, STDs had caused major problems for the US armed services. Doctors at the time reported 350,000 new gonorrhea infections every year in the armed services alone, and that led to 7 million lost man days. For a big chunk of the war, they hadn't yet even discovered that simple penicillin did cure many STDs, and so all those lost days ended up costing the US Army about $440 million a year. That's a lot of money, and there was a lot of money to be gained in not just being able to treat STDs, but also prevent people from catching them in the first place. The goal and motivation of the Guatemala experiment wasn't to help the subjects they were watching, it was to aid the US war effort. Simple as that. War is more effective when men don't have STDs. So with that as their motivation, an experiment was thought up by researchers in which they were going to use prisoners in Indiana, a trapped population, in which they would infect them with gonorrhea and then test out their prophylaxis, a post-exposure treatment given after the fact, obviously post-exposure, to prevent a disease sort of taking hold on the body. Kind of similar, I suppose, to PrEP for HIV, although PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you take it, and then if you have sex with somebody for HIV, it lowers the chances of catching it by 99%. The researchers here were mostly focusing on post-exposure prophylaxis, though. So if a man or a woman has sex with somebody who they believe, after the fact, to have syphilis, they can then take this drug, which will stop it actually taking a hold in the body. So, it was instead suggested by a Dr. Juan Funes, head of the Guatemalan Venereal Disease Control Department, that they move their experiment to Guatemala. Now, Dr. Funes had been trained by the US Public Health Service, so there were very big connections there, and he offered his and his country's services. Once again, it seems to be unclear why the Public Health Service thought Guatemala would be any better than Indiana, but we can take some good guesses. One guess that in Guatemala, sex work is legal and prisoners are able to pay for sex workers to come into the penitentiary. 
Obviously, that would mean that infection could happen more naturally and ideally make the doctor's work easier. The second, even less palatable guess is that the white doctors made a racially motivated decision. The lives of Guatemalan people would have meant less to them than the lives of American people, particularly Guatemalan prisoners, sex workers and psychiatric patients, especially considering a lot of these would have been indigenous people. It was acknowledged at the time by the US Surgeon General, Dr. Thomas Parron, that the things they ended up doing in Guatemala just could not have been done on US soil. They just wouldn't have got the go-ahead. I mean, saying that, they likely wouldn't have got the go-ahead in Guatemala either, but naturally, a lot of the details of the programme were hidden from the Guatemalan authorities. They didn't fully know what was going on. So, the Public Health Service and the Pan American Sanitary Bureau assigned Dr. Cutler, who had already been working on the Indiana Project, to lead this new research in Guatemala with the close assistance of Dr. Funes. It is important to note that whilst this was American research, they did have the go-ahead by the Guatemalan Ministry of Public Health, at least at the beginning. But as well as that, they had the go-ahead from the Director of the National Orphanage, the Director of Medical Services at the Penitentiary, the Director of the Psychiatric Hospital, and the Chief of the Army Medical Department. At the beginning, at least, this was done with the cooperation of the Guatemalan authorities, and this would have been done under the guise of the US trying to build infrastructure and help develop medical services in Guatemala. And also, in exchange, Cutler and his team were expected to test and treat men in the army barracks, soldiers, to do surveys of STDs in the lowlands, and provide more penicillin for the country, because penicillin was really hard to come by in Guatemala. And this experiment, or at least what they shared of the experiment, not what we know now, did pass review with the Public Health Service. However, it's very important to remember that all the people on the board of sort of yesing or knowing experiments knew each other. This was very much a man's club. They knew if they said yes to this experiment, maybe the board would approve their next experiment. It was all very mutually beneficial. So the experiment getting the go-ahead from the Public Health Service didn't necessarily mean that they thought it was ethical. So starting in 1947, intentional STD exposure experiments started in Guatemala, involving commercial sex workers, prisoners, psychiatric patients and soldiers, contained communities. Cutler and Funes had two goals, to find a way to prevent disease immediately after exposure, so to find a prophylaxis, and two, they wanted to test human response to fresh infected material to enhance body response to disease, to understand superinfection and reinfection. Infection. The term superinfection refers to the question as to whether if you'd had sort of one strain, could you get another strain and have both at the same time? And reinfection was to find out if you'd had syphilis once and been cured, could you get it again? Questions and answers which seem obvious now, but not back in the 1940s. But their primary goal here was the post-exposure prophylaxis. They wanted to create maybe a type of a wash you could use after exposure to stop you getting the disease. Dr. Cutler fully credits Dr. Funes with the idea of doing a controlled experiment with commercial sex workers as vectors in Guatemalan prisons. So the original idea was to use sex workers as vectors, as basically STD delivery devices, and just observe them within prisons spreading STDs, whilst also using the post-exposure prophylaxis that they were going to create. Following regulations of legal sex work in Guatemala in the 1940s, sex workers were legally mandated to report twice a week to the Centre for Venereal Disease for testing. If they were found to test positive for an STD, they had to be treated for whatever disease they had or they were no longer allowed to offer their services. The director of the centre was, of course, Dr Funes, and once he paired with the public health service, when the women were found to test positive, instead of being sent to be treated, they were just referred over to Dr Cutler. So the researchers here always knew that the sex workers inside the prisons were positive for either syphilis, gonorrhea, or chancroids. They should have technically been spreading diseases throughout the prison population. They were seen as a sort of STD delivery system. But almost straight away, Dr. Cutler felt like the rate of infection wasn't high enough, just like he'd found in Indiana. 
The idea was that a single sex worker could have sex with eight men in 71 minutes, which is insane. So in theory, the potential for spread of disease was huge, but that's just not really how it works. I think a big flaw in Cutler's plan here is that he didn't see these women, these sex workers, as human. He saw them as a machine to do his bidding, an STD delivery system, but he didn't put humanity into the equation. Just because they could technically have sex with eight men in just over an hour, it didn't mean they were going to. And sex for people, both men and women, doesn't necessarily mean just penis in vagina sex. It got to a point where Cutler and his people were having to watch these sex workers and prisoners have sex to ensure they were doing it right, to ensure infection. And further proof that Dr. Cutler failed to see these women as women is that he didn't even see them as subjects for his experiment. They were below even subjects. They didn't have subject note cards. They didn't have any notes on them at all. And no effort was ever made to cure any of the sex workers of their STDs. There's also never been any evidence that informed consent in any form was ever obtained from anyone involved in this experiment, nor the sex workers, nor the subjects. And there was also a massive heteronormative assumption here, a flaw in the experiment as Cutler assumed that the only way of infection was from sex worker to prisoner. However, he failed to account for the fact that many of the prisoners may well have been having sex with each other as well. But I suppose to Cutler that wouldn't have mattered too much as his main goal here was the prophylaxis to test the prophylaxis and not how the disease spread. As long as people had STDs, it was all good. Once Cutler realised that the rate of infection just wasn't high enough in the prison, this is kind of where he crosses the line. He tried to make the women even more infected, and he did so by putting pus from fresh sores into their vaginas before they had intercourse, or by injecting syphilis into their cervixes, which as you can imagine was an incredibly painful and invasive procedure. We've been talking a lot about the sex workers here, but what about the prisoners, the subjects of Cutler's experiment? No one's really telling them what's going on, they're just being plied with alcohol and free cigarettes and they're getting to have lots of sex, although with random people watching. But no one at any point has asked for their consent, no one's explained what's actually going on to them. Of course there is a language barrier between them and the doctors, but even if there wasn't, they weren't trying to explain anything. The prisoners are also having to have their blood drawn regularly in order to see if they're catching the STDs, and as you can imagine, the prisoners hate that. Nobody likes getting their blood taken, especially as some reports say it was up to twice a day. They're having so much blood drawn that they're also having to be given pills to help with the anemia they get as a result. They didn't like it, obviously, so eventually they refuse to cooperate. So it's at this point that Cutler decides to move on to his next captive population, the National Orphanage in Guatemala City, where you'll probably be pleased to know that they did not give children syphilis. They just did lots and lots of blood tests to see if any of them already had congenital syphilis. Now three of the children did have external signs of syphilis, so they were given penicillin, but 89 of them received positive results on their tests but showed no clinical external signs, and it's not written anywhere that they received treatment. In exchange for being allowed to experiment in the orphanage, Cutler traded drugs for malaria, which was a huge problem at the time. I suppose at this point I should probably give you an actual overview of the three diseases that were sort of being spread around here. So that's gonorrhea, syphilis and chancroid. Just so you can get an idea of how truly awful this is, trying to give people these diseases. Chancroid is probably the one that most people haven't heard of, so we'll start there. It's just not very common at all in the US and Europe, but it is a lot more common in developing countries all around the world. And it can be very difficult to diagnose because it often gets lumped in with other STDs with very similar symptoms for men, and women are often just asymptomatic. The incubation time of chancroid from exposure to symptoms is only about three to seven days, and said symptoms can include very raised and painful bumps on the skin of your genitals, ulcers with soft edges, reddened and shiny skin, pus and infectious fluid, and the spreading and connecting of these sores, so three different sores can become one massive sore. Again, women are often unaware of these sores, but in men they can be very, very painful. It's thought that the chancroid bacterium enters your body through tiny tears in the skin during sexual activity because it just doesn't really tend to infect skin that doesn't have any abrasions. Nowadays, it's very, very treatable with antibiotics. 
Gonorrhea is spread through infectious fluids that transfer during sex, the typical symptoms being a very thick green or yellow discharge from the genitals for both men and women. It can also cause pain when peeing and for women it can cause bleeding in between periods. However, for about 1 in 10 men and in about half infected women, there will be no symptoms at all which is why it's so important to get tested. Again, nowadays it's very easily treated with just a single injection and in about 10-20% to of women a lack of treatment can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease which can lead to long term pelvic pain, infertility and if you do manage to fall pregnant, ectopic pregnancy and miscarriage. So if you have gonorrhea, even if you're asymptomatic, you want to get treated. Syphilis is probably the scariest of the three, although to be honest, you don't really want any of these, and like the rest, it's caused by bacteria and spread through sexual contact. But syphilis can be much more serious if not caught quickly, because it has three very distinct stages, and most who catch syphilis will not notice any symptoms at the time of infection or later, not until it's much too late. Preferred stage, so primary syphilis, can occur anywhere from 10 days to 3 months after infection, where a small, painless ulcer will appear on part of the body where the infection was transmitted. You might also get swollen lymph nodes. A lot of people won't notice the ulcer because it's painless and then it will just disappear, leaving the syphilis to move on to the secondary stage. A few weeks after the sore disappears, you might get a non-itchy rash somewhere on the body, usually on the palm of your hands or soles of your feet but not always. You'll be tired, maybe you'll have a headache, swollen lymph nodes, fever, joint pains. You might just feel like you've got a bad cold or you're a bit run down. Again, those symptoms will eventually disappear but might come and go over a period of several months. The symptoms do not scream STD. Then syphilis becomes latent. You'll still be infected but you'll have no symptoms, it just remains dormant in your system for a very long time, sometimes even decades. But if you remain untreated, you'll move on to the final stage, which is tertiary syphilis. One in three people with syphilis will eventually develop serious symptoms, with the infection spreading to scary parts of the body, your brain, nerves, eyes, heart, bone, skin, blood vessels, and this can cause a whole host of symptoms which can lead to death. You can get a stroke, dementia, numbness, paralysis, blindness, deafness, heart disease, loss of coordination, neurosyphilis, which is bacterial infection of the brain and or spinal cord. Now the good news is that even in late stage syphilis, you can still receive treatment, which is just antibiotics, and the infection will be cured. However, the damage that is already done to your body, to your organs, is irreversible. You don't want this to happen. Safe to say, you don't want any of these diseases. Good news is they're all now quite easily curable. If you catch them early enough, you're going to be fine with no long-lasting side effects. A huge amount of the subjects in Guatemala wouldn't have that option. So Cutler had found out very quickly that the problem with using prisoners as subjects was that they had their own minds, they had autonomy to an extent, and even then horrible things still happened to them. I mean undeniably what they had to go through was sexual assault at the very, very least. Going forward, with Cutler now deciding to move on to psych hospitals for subjects, the less autonomy a person was perceived to have, the more invasive the methods the researchers would use. And I say perceived because a lot of the people in these hospitals weren't actually mentally ill. A huge number of the patients just had epilepsy or were guilty of homosexuality. And don't misconstrue my words, I'm not saying it's worse because these psych patients did know what was going on, I mean it's awful no matter to what degree of mental illness someone is suffering, but they were treated as if they didn't know what was happening, they were treated as if they didn't have their own minds, they had zero autonomy, they weren't treated as human. Now obviously in the psychiatric hospital they couldn't use sex workers as a means of STD delivery, so what they decided to do instead was create an inoculum with which they could give the subjects these diseases. But making a syphilis inoculum is not an easy feat, because to do so they need to get hold of the responsible bacteria and this is a sexually transmitted disease for a reason, it's not transmitted by blood. 
However, luckily for these researchers, rabbits can get syphilis. So the researchers in Guatemala have a whole load of infected rabbits transported to them from the venereal disease lab in Staten Island. The researchers kill the rabbits, grind up the testes of the male rabbits and make a syphilis inoculum from that, ready to inject straight into humans. They got the subjects in the hospital to agree to be inoculated by offering them just free cigarettes and from there it begins actually injecting people with syphilis. Still at this point no consent has ever been obtained, even the hospital officials weren't aware of what was going on. And I'm saying they injected people with syphilis but actually I suppose that's tame compared to what they really did. With the male patients, they would take their penises and pull back the foreskin before scarifying it with a hypodermic needle. They would basically make shallow abrasions in the skin. They would then take a piece of cotton gauze or a Q-tip as they called it with the inoculum on it and apply it to the incision multiple times over the space of an hour. Now a Q-tip is quite often referred to as being used in these experiments, but I came to find out this so-called Q-tip was actually a toothpick with a bit of gauze on the end, which is just even worse. The women got it slightly better to begin with, I suppose, because of rules around male doctors treating female patients. So instead of getting anything sort of directly applied to their genitals, the women would just get their forearms, face or mouth abraded before the inoculum would be inserted in those abrasions. The end target was the same, giving them syphilis, but I guess it was slightly less invasive, I suppose. The researchers ended up comparing all these sort of different forms of introducing syphilis to the body. They compared sort of scraping the arm before giving the inoculum versus not scraping the arm. What happened if they mixed syphilitic tissue with water and made the subjects drink it? What happened if they injected syphilis directly into the bloodstream? I mean, at one point they were even doing cisternal punctures, which was literally just injecting syphilis into the back of people's skulls in the hope of speeding along neurosyphilis. They were looking at if it's injected close to the brain, does it make the body move faster through the stages? Cutler's doing all of this, and yet in each example, he's failing to perform any prophylaxis study at all, which is the whole reason he's there. It's just gone off on a completely different tangent. All seven women who received these cisternal punches, the injections into the back of the skulls, did have epilepsy, as did a lot of hospital patients. Apparently now the researchers thought that this might help cure epilepsy. Obviously it didn't, but they did each get bacterial meningitis and then had to be treated for that. Just another road they tried to take this experiment down, now they're trying to cure epilepsy. And at the same time as the test in the psychiatric hospital, researchers were also at a local army barracks, with the men being allowed to have sex with uninfected sex workers before having the syphilitic inoculum injected straight into their penis. They would then be made to urinate an hour later before all different kinds of prophylaxis were applied. In other studies, the inoculum would be placed onto the cervix of the sex workers before they were then sent to have sex with the soldiers and then they were testing if that was more infectious. Eventually, as well as using the syphilitic inoculums from the rabbits, they started using the bacteria from other patients who they'd successfully injected, and then the infections just jumping from patient to patient. Like, it's impossible to keep up with what was the actual aim, the purpose of this experiment. At one point with the men, Cutler was using two different techniques, a superficial and a deep inoculum. For the superficial arm, he was putting infected pus on one of the aforementioned Q-tips and placing it onto the tip of the penis, so not entering deeply into the urethra. For the deep arm, as you might guess, the swab would be entered half an inch deep into the urethra and applied to the mucous membrane. He referred to the superficial inoculation as the active arm of his experiment and the deep as the control arm, but he was infecting them in two different methods, so it couldn't have been a control arm which out of everything to criticise in the experiment does seem very small, but like even the scientific technique here was just plain incorrect. Cutler would discover that the superficial technique would only affect about 50% of people as compared with the deep technique which would affect 98%. But you've got to remember that this is not what this experiment was supposed to be for. This was supposed to be to test prophylaxis. How can you say that a prophylaxis is working effectively when using the less effective method of inoculation? What was the point of doing that? There were so many issues with the research integrity here and eventually the whole thing seemed to be less about prophylaxis than just using the subjects for their whims and wanderings about STDs. Just whilst they're there, let's test this and this. They started an experiment at one point into diagnostic tests as well as prophylactic, but inherently there were just so many flaws. 
According to all of the documents found, 5,540 people were found to be involved in this experiment overall, but that number was the total number of people, including all of the sort of diagnostic experiments and experiments into proper dosages of penicillin. It didn't mean that that many people were injected or infected with anything. It was actually a total of 1,308 subjects involved in the intentional exposure experiment, and of that number, only 700 would later receive treatment for the STDs they were exposed to. We can say they received treatment, but we cannot say they were cured because the data is so sporadic. That leaves over 600 people who never received any treatment at all for the diseases the researchers purposefully injected them with. And of course, it doesn't end there. There's no way of knowing how many other people would go on to be infected because of this. Let's say the majority of those people had sex with one person and passed on. That's a thousand people infected, then 2,000, then 4,000. Don't quote me on my maths here, you get what I'm trying to say, but the buck doesn't end with the person subjected to this experiment. This is a sexually transmitted disease. These people would go on to have sex with more people and spread this disease. I mean, some of them probably even went on to have kids with congenital syphilis. As I said earlier in this episode, penicillin was very hard to come by in Guatemala, so they likely didn't get treatment after the fact either. According to documents found, 696 people were exposed to syphilis, 722 to gonorrhea, and 142 to chancroid. And deaths very much did occur during the testing on patients at the psychiatric hospital, but most of these deaths were just attributed to underlying diseases and never the STD research. So again, there's no way of knowing just how many people directly lost their lives because of this. The number of people who died during the experiment was 83, but again, was never said to be directly because of it. Just one example of a death likely caused by the experiment was Berta, a female patient at the psychiatric hospital. In February 1948, she was injected in her left arm with syphilis, and a month later, she developed scabies. Several weeks later, it was noted by Cutler that she developed red bumps where she'd been injected, lesions on her arms and legs, and her skin was beginning to waste away from her body. Berta was not treated for syphilis until three months after the initial injection. On August 23rd, Cutler wrote that it appeared Berta was going to die, but he didn't write why. The same day, he puts gonorrheal pus from a male subject into both of her eyes, as well as her urethra and rectum. I can only assume by this point that the rule about male doctors and female patients had just gone out the window. Several days later, Berta's eyes were filled with pus and she was bleeding from her urethra. She died on August 27th. So yes, people died because of this. And we do also know for sure that there were 18 subjects involved in this who were under the age of 18. So there were 18 children. One of these was a soldier as young as 10 years old who was involved in three different experiments with a sex worker and then was also infected with gonorrhea by hand. 10 years old, that's child abuse, sexual abuse. But again, there was very limited information about this. So we've got a scientific experiment in which no consent was received, children were tested on, seemingly no solid notes were kept, and the study just seemed to go off in multiple directions away from what it was originally supposed to be. This was just testing for the sake of testing on unwilling subjects, just seeing what they could get away with. And I do want to touch again on the ethics here because this really isn't something we're just applying to modern day ethical judgment. Researchers knew even at this time that this was unethical and they did it anyway. They knew they could get away with it in Guatemala. A man called Dr. Harry Eagle was on the board that approved the Guatemala research and he'd actually been doing his own research, his own experiments, looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis. He'd done a write-up of his own experiment in which he said the case held very good for rabbits, but there were no tests on humans because the only way to do so would be to give people syphilis, and that was ethically impossible. He wrote that it was going to take years to gather the information he needed to go ahead with his research. And then he ends up on the board that approves the Guatemala research and ends up writing to the team down there asking if he could use some of their subjects to conduct his own experiment in humans, something that he'd already deemed ethically impossible in the USA. But now they were using mostly indigenous Guatemalan people, it was suddenly okay. 
there's correspondence in which researchers write they didn't bother explaining to the Indians, as they referred to the Guatemalan people, because they would simply get confused by the explanation. They didn't deem them intelligent enough to understand what was going on. They deemed them less than human. Other correspondence also shows that they knew people in the psychiatric hospital couldn't give consent, writing that soldiers would be the best to use because they could consent. In a letter written to Dr John Cutler from his supervisor Robert Arnold in April 1948, I am a bit, in fact more than a bit, leery of the experiment with the insane people. They cannot give consent, do not know what was going on, and if some goody organisation got wind of the work, they would raise a lot of smoke. I think the soldiers would be best, or the prisoners, for they can give consent. Also, how many knew what was going on? I realised that a dozen could be infected, develop the disease and be cured before anything could be suspected. The penicillin could be a prescription for the insanity. Your first study could be done in a short time and none would be the wiser. In the report, I see no reason to say where the work was being done and the type of volunteer. You know the setup best, but be sure that all angles have been covered. And almost a year beforehand, Cutler had written to the Venereal Disease Research Lab Director, Dr John Mahoney, saying, I'm writing this letter personally and unofficially to ask you about several very important matters. First, as you know, it is imperative that the least possible be known and said about this project, for a few words that the wrong person here or even at home might wreck it or parts of it. We have found out there has been more talk here than we like with the knowledge of the work turning up in queer places. So, yes, safe to say, they knew what they were doing was wrong. As gossip grew back home, Cutler faced pressure from his supervisors to finish up his work. Or actually, the pressure was building for a really long time, probably from around autumn 1947. And this is probably why Cutler really started to amp up the experiment, injecting people, doing whatever he could to get them to show symptoms. John Cutler at this time was only about 31 years old. This was his first big assignment with the Public Health Service. He wanted to impress his much older and much more established supervisors. But in 1948, he was forced to wind the experiment down and for all intents and purposes, by the end of 1948, Cutler and his team did leave Guatemala. But we know that doctors continued taking tissue samples and performing autopsies on the subjects until 1958. The study was never published though, and as I said at the beginning of this episode, no one's entirely sure exactly why, there's no confirmation of a reason, but it's probably because they knew how unethical it was, they knew the backlash that could cover this, and the public health service really didn't want it to become public knowledge. Some of the data was pushed into other articles, but it was never properly cited. And Dr Cutler never seemed ashamed of the work he'd done in Guatemala. I think that's pretty well demonstrated in the fact he donated all the documents rather than just let them get lost or destroyed. He wanted the work to be seen, maybe even to be used. But can you ethically use data that was obtained in an unethical way? I don't think you can. When the information about the Guatemala experiment came out publicly in 2010, you probably imagine it caused public outrage, but honestly, it didn't. Most people still wouldn't have really heard the details about this. The USA, though, were, of course, quick to issue their apology and launch the Presidential Commission to review it, leading to a 48-page report eventually being released. Dr Amy Gutman, head of the commission, said in her concluding remarks and presenting the research to the presidential panel, those involved in the study failed to show a minimal respect for human rights and morality in the conduct of research. She then went on to describe the actions and the people behind the study as morally culpable to various degrees. Even by the standards of this time, this was bad. There's no denying that simple fact. As you would probably expect, many Guatemalans didn't accept an apology from the US as being enough. In March 2011, several plaintiffs filed a federal class action lawsuit against the US government, claiming damages for the experiments. It argued that the US was at fault for not asking for consent. However, the suit was dismissed when it was determined that the US government was immune from liability for actions committed outside the US, which is why they did it in Guatemala in the first place. And then, in April 2015, 774 plaintiffs launched another lawsuit against John Hopkins University, the pharmaceutical company Bristol Myers Squibb, and the Rockefeller Foundation. They wanted to hold the university accountable because the doctors held important roles on panels there, claiming the university were actively involved in the experiments. 
In January 2019, a judge rejected the defendant's argument that a recent Supreme Court decision shielding foreign corporations from lawsuits in US courts over human rights also applied to them. However, in April 2022, which is obviously really recent, the district court ruled in favour of the defendants. John Hopkins had not aided or abetted any violations of law committed by Cutler and the team. Now, when it came to the Tuskegee experiments, the US government did eventually compensate some of the subjects. For Guatemala, the Department of Health and Human Services did announce $1.8 million to improve treatment and prevention of HIV and other STDs in Guatemala, and 800,000 of that did go straight to the country, whilst a million was retained to continue evaluation into human subjects. However, nothing has ever been given specifically to the subjects here, the people who had their entire lives changed and potentially destroyed. Now, of course, a number of them have since passed, but no doubt some are still alive or their families have been affected through the generations and they deserve compensation. Compensation that is nowhere on the horizon. And whilst the commission did release their report on Guatemala, it mostly focuses on the morals and ethics around the experiment. It makes reference to Tuskegee and the Nuremberg trials. However, it lacks explicit discussion around the legal responsibility and accountability of the US government, which is no doubt a minefield, but this was a presidential commission. The Nuremberg Code prohibiting human medical research without informed consent is argued to have come into action on the 17th of August 1947. The Guatemala experiment would have violated this code from that day onwards, even though it began before that point. There is no researcher in the world who would have been unaware of what was happening in Nuremberg. In all honesty, I'm not really sure how to round up an episode like this one. This was a violation of human rights by people who saw their subjects as less than human. This was an experiment which Guatemalans are undoubtedly still feeling the after effects of to this very day. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm sorry for the past like 10 minutes of this episode, you've been able to hear awful rain that's going on outside, like the heavens have actually opened. So if it sounded a bit fuzzy, that's why it's just rain. Pathetic fallacy, I feel like it suits how awful this episode is. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.